Welcome to this presentation from Registers of Scotland on plans and mapping. After today's short uh, webinar, I would hope that the learning outcomes you will take from this will be a bit of background to mapping, understanding what the cadastral map is and the Ordnance Survey Master Map, some elements of our deed plan criteria and uh, issues relating to deed plans, overlapping titles, common challenges that you may encounter and how to overcome them, and tenements, flatted property issues and how Registers of Scotland deals with them as part of the registration process. So the content of today's uh, presentation will be a background to mapping, deed plan criteria, overlaps. I'm going to start with what is the cadastral map? Historically, cadastral maps were used for taxation purposes when people were taxed on how much land they owned. It was vital to know who owned land and how much they owned. They were first introduced in Napoleonic France and quickly spread throughout, throughout Europe, as did Napoleon. We never had a cadastral map for Britain, probably because we were never invaded by Napoleon. And although there was an attempt shortly after the First World War to collate information about land ownership and land parcels as a step to introducing a tax based on land ownership, this came to nothing. If you are interested, the maps and records that were prepared for this are still held by the National Records of Scotland. Our cadastral map was introduced by the Land Registration Etc Scotland Act 2012. I'll refer to this as the 2012 Act. On this slide, we can see an extract from the cadastral map for George Square in Glasgow. The cadastral map is defined in the 2012 Act as a map showing the totality of the registered geospatial data, which in basic terms means it is a map of Scotland showing all the land register titles, including the rights and encumbrances that have been mapped. When you see all the titles mapped together like this, it can look very busy. Although the term cadastral map is new in relation to the land registration in Scotland, we have kept what we call an index map from 1981, when we first started registering titles in Renfrew under the 1979 Act. We knew even then it was crucial to know what we had already registered before we started mapping any new titles. The 2012 Act provides that the cadastral map must be based on the Ordnance Survey map, as did the 1979 Act before it. The current base map for the cadastral map is a product the Ordnance Survey call Master Map. This is a digital map covering the whole of the UK, including Scotland. This extract of Master Map shows our office in Glasgow at St Vincent Plaza beside the M8 motorway. Master map was derived from historical maps that the Ordnance Survey have published over the years, such as the county series and landline products. This means the map has some restrictions in relation to tolerance and scale, which is a result of the way the map has been developed and surveyed by the OS over the years. And years, we mean well over 150 years in some areas. Traditionally, the Ordnance Survey produced maps at three scales. 1 to 12.50, which is the left-hand image, was used in cities and large urban areas. It is the most detailed scale the Ordnance Survey produces maps at. This scale shows most features as they appear on the ground, including intricate details of buildings such as bay windows and conservatories. 1 to 2,500 scale is used in more rural areas, including rural towns and villages. The map will not show certain details that appear in the ground due to the scale of the map. The Ordnance Survey will stylize certain features, for example, where in the 1250 map, the Ordnance Survey will show a bay window, at 12, 1 to 2,500 scale, they will not. 1 to 10,000 scale is called Mountain and Moorland. The majority of Scotland was originally mapped to this scale for obvious reasons. A lot of Scotland is mountain and moorland. 
The map of Scotland on the right hand side of the slide shows that about 60% of Scotland was originally captured at this scale. This is now changing. The Ordnance Survey are constantly improving their mapping using modern technology and survey techniques to reduce the amount of 1 to 10,000 scale mapping. And most hamlets, houses and other notable buildings that were once mapped at that scale are now surveyed at 1 to 25,000 specification, giving a far better map representation of what is on the ground and improved accuracy and geometric fidelity of the map. This example shows the differences between 1 to 2500 mapping and 1 to 10,000 mapping. If you look at the river on the 1 to 2500 scale map, the true width of the river is shown. On the 1 to 10,000 map, the river is generalised as a single line. If you come across this situation where you are mapping a title on the cadastral map, it can result in an odd looking title. If a boundary is said to follow the medium film of the river on the 1 to 2500 map, it will be mapped to the, into the middle of the river. But as it moves to the 1 to 10,000 map, it will just be mapped to the line shown on the map. This clearly shows the limitation of 1 to 10,000 mapping. If the 1 to 10,000 map is updated by the Ordnance Survey to the 1 to 2500 specification and the correct width of the river was shown on the map, we would remap the title to the medium film if this is supported by the underlying title. If you look at the bottom of the images, you will see the road. With roads, the opposite happens. On the 2500 map, the true width of the road is mapped, but on the 1 to 10,000 map, roads are mapped to a standard width. This is a legacy of old paper maps, because if the roads were plotted to scale, it would not be visible when the map was printed out. So the Ordnance Survey standardised the width of roads so they could clearly be seen on a paper map. The Ordnance Survey used different standards depending if the road was single track, two lane road or even dual carriageway. This all seems a bit old fashioned now as we've moved away from paper maps to the digital age. And as mentioned previously, a lot of the features are now being refined using one to two and a half thousand scale specification. When it comes to mapping cadastral units, if a title is shown to go to the edge of a road, we will map it to the edge of the road regardless of the scale of the map. Again, if the Ordnance Survey map is updated to a larger scale, we will update titles where the underlying titles support this. I will move on to some of the questions we are asked about the suitability of different types of deed plans and some of the issues we encounter in relation to raster mapping. Some customers ask if they can use a raster map for a deed plan. A raster map being the small scale Ordnance Survey map that is commonly 1 to 25,000 or 1 to 50,000. These are the maps people will use for hill walking and general navigation. You know the ones with the pink or orange covers. On this image, we can see the raster map side by side with the master map product. The key difference between the two maps is the generalization on the raster map of all the map features. We can see that we have a stylized view of the road, whereas in the master map we can see the true width of the road and verges. We can also see that buildings have been generalized in the raster map, whereas the master map more accurately reflects their true position. The master map is also a more up to date map product showing more boundaries. If you had a deed plan for the Crask Inn based on the raster map for registration, it would not be possible for us to interpret and plot it onto the Ordnance Survey master map, as we could not be certain where the boundaries of the property were positioned. For example, is it the dotted line or is it the edge of the building and the fence feature shown? In this case, we would reject the application. If you want to know if your deed plan is suitable for registration, I suggest you get a plans report, either from Registers of Scotland or one of the other suppliers. I also refer you to the Registers of Scotland knowledge base online, which contains deep plan criteria for you to refer to. There are, however, some occasions where it may be possible to use a raster map, 
especially in mountain and moorland areas, where the master map may still be 1 to 10,000 scale. Again, however, if you want to be sure your map can be used for registration, the plans report will be able to tell you. If preparing a small scale survey or raster plan for submission in a PDF format, remember to have this at a suitable scale to allow the boundaries to be accurately identified on the master map. We recommend no smaller than 1 to 10,000. I'm now going to talk about deed plan criteria. The main thing to think about with deed plans is can the extent of the subjects be shown on the plan be transposed onto the cadastral map by the keeper? If we cannot work out the extent and accurately plot it onto the cadastral map, the plan will not be suitable. Here we have an example of a deed plan where the property is represented by a pink tint, a scale bar, a measurement, a north point and a street. Take a moment to think about that plan. Do you think that this plan would be suitable for registration purposes? The answer to that question would be no. The main issue with the previous plan was that there was no surrounding details, which would allow us to tie the subjects to the Ordnance Survey map and therefore relate it to other properties already mapped on the cadastral map. For example, in this case, knowing the position of the boundaries in relation to its neighbours is crucial, such as knowing the house is semi-detached, for example. That helps us when we come to plot it. On this image here, we can see a small scale deed plan with the subjects tinted pink at a scale of 1 to 25,000. Have a moment to think about that plan. Do you think it is suitable for registration purposes? The main issue with that deed plan is that, as we've discussed previously, although it is based on the Ordnance Survey Master Map, it has been prepared at 1 to 25,000 scale, which is too small to enable some of the boundaries to be identified on the cadastral map. We can see on this image, on the left hand side, that even when we zoom in to the plan as far as we can, the boundaries are unidentifiable in relation to the underlying map. An application based on this plan would fall for rejection. We are often asked if monochrome or black and white copies of deed plans can be used for registration. The simple answer is sometimes we can and sometimes we cannot. I'll explain. Plan one is a plan for a house plot with exclusive garden ground with the rights of common property and servitude rights all shown in the plan. In the deed itself, the text refers to various colour references. Plan 2 is for an area of ground lying to the west of a road, which leads to a burn. It is the area shaded on the plan with measurements. Take a moment to consider those two plans. Which of those two monochrome plans is acceptable for registration purposes? Would it be plan one? Would it be plan two? Both of them? Or neither of them? The answer to that question is plan two is acceptable. Plan 2 is acceptable because we can clearly make out the boundaries. We have measurements, surrounding details and a north point. We could locate this property and map it onto the cadastral map. The problem with plan 1 is not necessarily the plan itself, it is how the plan reads with the deed. In this case, the deed referred to the property having exclusive areas coloured pink, red and hatched red. 
a write in common, so a store hatched in blue, and a path tinted brown, and a servitude write over a path tinted yellow. Although you might be able to take a guess what the various parts are, you cannot do this with any certainty and accurately plot the subjects onto the cadastral map. Wherever possible, it is always better to try to use the original deed plan, as this was the plan agreed by parties to the original conveyance and is a true representation of the title. But with the passage of time, it is not always possible to use those plans, especially if the scale of the Ordnance Survey map has changed or where an original plan included colour references which cannot be worked out from a black and white copy. As I've mentioned previously, if there's any doubt, it is best to obtain a plans report either carried out by Registers of Scotland or one of the other suppliers, and that should let you know whether it is acceptable or not. And remember that any new plan prepared to show references that cannot be identified a monochrome plan should be checked to ensure that the new plan is correct prior to submission. An example which caused a problem for us recently was where the original conveyance referred to the subjects as being two areas of ground, where the new plan only showed one area of ground but kept the same description. I'm now going to talk about the problems that can sometimes occur when you get a new plan drawn up prepared for registration. The image on the left is the original deed plan. This plan is not acceptable for registration as it is a floating shape. The image on the right is the new plan drawn up and based on the master map. As you can see, the extent of the subject shown in the plan and over which registration was sought does not agree with the features shown on the Ordnance Survey map. When we tried to map the property, this is what we found. The area tinted blue was a competition with a registered title. The areas tinted yellow formed part of the subject shown in the new deed plan, but fell out with the fenced extent as viewed on the Ordnance Survey map. The areas tinted brown do not form part of the subject shown tinted pink in the new plan, but fall within the fenced extent shown on the Ordnance Survey map. In this case, whoever drafted the new deed plan did a simple re-representation of the extent shown in the old deed plan onto the new Ordnance Survey map, but they did not consider the features shown on the map. So it is important that when you get a new plan prepared, to check that it makes sense in relation to what is on the ground and the boundaries defined on the Ordnance Survey map. Again, remembering that a plans report can assist in identifying these issues. And one thing to remember about plans reports is that they should be used for all first registrations if there's any doubt about the deed plans, not just first registrations for a sale of the property. The keeper currently has a policy that if issues like this are identified within three months of the application date, the application would be rejected due to the competition with the registered title. If this issue is identified by us after three months of the application date, we would correspond with the agent and point out these issues to reach a resolution to hopefully allow registration to proceed or allow the agent to withdraw the application. In this particular case, we contacted the agent and it was agreed we would register the subject to the pink and brown, omitting the areas tinted yellow and blue. Unsuitable deed plans. This is a copy of what on the face of it looks like a decent quality deed plan, as it is a new plan drawn by an architect with lots of features and measurements. The property this plan is for is the plot measuring 0.157 hectares outlined in red on the left hand side of the plan. The plan was originally deemed OK when the deed was submitted, as on the face of it, it looked acceptable. The problems came when we tried to map it. It became apparent that while it is a good architect's plan, it bears no resemblance to the Ordnance Survey Master Map and no features tied in accurately to allow us to plot it onto the cadastral map. The application was subsequently rejected because of this. This issue is something 
to really watch out for and can seem counterintuitive. Sometimes plans drawn by architects are drawn to such a large scale, such as 1 to 200, they are not actually suitable for land registration as they just do not fit in with the Ordnance Survey map. Poor quality deed plans. The original deed plan is shown in this image based on the historic Ordnance Survey County Series map. The subjects in the deed are the area shown by the black coloured area, roughly in the middle. This would not be acceptable for registration. The problem being with this plan was that when new plans were prepared to represent this extent, there were different interpretations. One interpretation of the extent of the black area was submitted for registration as the area shown colored green on the left hand image, which was to register the land edge red under exception of the area's colour green. This was registered. There was then submitted an application to register the exception itself, and that extent was shown in the deed plan tinted pink on the right hand image. As you can see, that extent does not agree with the area registered tinted green and overlapped with that registered extent. The application to register the area tinted pink on the right hand image would then have to be rejected. This next example shows us the problem with overlapping titles. Overlapping titles is something you really need to be on the lookout for when you're dealing with a first or voluntary registration. There is a simple rule in the 2012 Act which states that the same area of ground owned exclusively by different people cannot be included in two cadastral units. What this means is that when we are registering a title for the first time and we come across a competing title, the title we are trying to register should be rejected. What this means for you is that you need to make sure that you know about any competitions before the application is submitted so you can do something about them. If you become aware of a competition, there are a few options open to you. If the area is of no value or interest to your client, omit that area from the deed being registered. This can be done by getting a new deed plan or stating in the deed that the subjects are being registered under exception of the part which forms part of the other registered title, quoting the title number in the deed. Alternatively, if the area is of importance, it may be the registered title could be rectified as the register may be inaccurate in including this area. This would involve a notification to post registration inquiries informing us of a manifest inaccuracy in the register and providing evidence which demonstrates this inaccuracy. If an inaccuracy cannot be shown, it may be the corrective conveyancing is required to correct the situation. As overlaps and competing titles is such a broad topic, we do not have time during this short webinar to go into this in any depth. However, I refer you to the Registers of Scotland Knowledge Base, which is detailed guidance on identifying competitions in title, inaccuracies and rectification of the register. A couple of important points to note, however, if a plans report identifies a competition in title, this must be acted on prior to the application for registration being submitted, else the application will fall for rejection under the one shot rule. And if the decision is made to simply omit the area of competition from the subjects being submitted for registration, this must be narrated in the disposition, not the application form, or again, the application will also fall for rejection. An issue we often encounter is deep plans, both historic and new, that do not represent the full extent of the references narrated in the deed. For example, plans are sometimes submitted to fit the size of a page, resulting in incomplete references in relation to the text, with no smaller scale location plans showing the full extent, or the full extent of the references are not shown. Examples of these are shown in this slide 
with the image on the left showing that the access road has been cut off at the edge of the page and the image on the right clearly showing that the references for the path is incomplete. Other examples may be a right of access narrated as leading from the public road shown in the deed plan, but the reference being cut off on the plan before the reference reaches that public road. These are all examples of partial references that cannot be plotted onto the cadastral map and would either result in the application being rejected or having the right, burden or servitude being omitted from the title sheet. Another issue we come across is references for larger areas, such as retained or burdened benefited properties that are shown on large scale plans, but are taken to the limit of the page width. An example shown in this slide with a benefited property being defined in the deed as outlined in green on the plan. Although perhaps slightly unclear on this reduced size image, the area outlined in green does go around the edge of the plan border. This would be reflected exactly per the deed plan as shown edged in brown on the right hand image, even though this does look rather odd on the cadastral map. To summarise the last two slides, ensure that all rights, burdens or servitudes are fully defined in the deed plans to match the narration in the deeds and ensure that the references make sense. I'm going to finish today's webinar by talking about tenements and briefly our policy on tenement steadings. In most cases, there are not any problems, particularly for traditional Victorian tenements you find in most of our major towns and cities. In these cases, the tenement steading being the area of ground which includes the building, the any garden ground and back green is usually defined on the Ordnance Survey map. And in most cases, you will find that at least one flat in the tenement is already registered and we have an extent for it on the cadastral map. Before you apply to register a flat in a tenement, you can check if you already hold an extent for the building. Plans reports from our report service or other providers will provide sufficient information. If we already hold an acceptable extent, you do not need to define a tenement steading in your application. If you do not hold an extent for the tenement steading, you will need to sufficiently describe it in your application for us to delineate it on the cadastral map. We do come across some difficulties in old local authority housing areas where we are dealing with flatted properties which are not traditional tenements, such as a four and a block. The aerial photograph you can see in this image shows a local authority housing estate in Dundee. The tenement steadings are not defined, i.e. there are no fe features on, shown on the Ordnance Survey map or the photography that define the extent of the tenement and all ground and cartilage in relation to each block. So what do we do? Firstly, we look at the deed plan. This flat forms part of the block 24 Abbotsford Street. You can see the subjects have a right in common to the solum of the block coloured red, exclu exclusive garden area coloured pink, and a right in common to the drying area and paths at the front and rear of the block coloured green and blue. We will look at what is already, already registered on the index map. Is there a flat within the block already registered? If there is, we will take that extent and the extent of the subjects we were looking to register and combine them to form the tenement standing cadastral unit. We build up the cadastral unit for the tenement as titles come in. The tenement standing cadastral unit will grow over time as different flats within the block that share common rights are registered. The tenement steading will include the extent of all the exclusive and shared areas which pertain to the flats within that block. Every time we change the extent of the cadastral unit for the tenement, we will update the previous title registered within the tenement to reflect the updated tenement steading. 
what we will not do is amend any mapping that pertains to the flats themselves. This updating of the tenement steading does not interfere with the rights or the persons within the tenement. That concludes today's webinar. Hopefully um, it's, you found this uh, presentation interesting. For more information, I refer you to the Registers of Scotland Knowledge Base, for which uh, an article has been prepared on mapping requirements. The internet address is shown in this slide. If you require any further information regarding any element of this presentation or other aspects of registration, Registers of Scotland can be contacted using the details shown on this slide. Thank you very much.